front of me. <laughs> I told you I want everyone to know me. So you fixed this now. Yeah. So We're good. Okay, places, everyone, places. <laughs> you, um, I oh, I gotta plug it in. Thank you. Tell you what, we gotta start praying for somebody. Oh, no, it's plugged in. Somebody plugged it in. I plugged it in. <laughs> Thank you. Places, everyone. Places. Uh, where's that from? Anybody remember? What show was that? Yeah, it was over. What show? Something Island. Oh, yeah. Ricardo Montalban. Ricardo Montalban was the ad guy. That was on right after uh, Love Boat. Remember Love Boat? Yeah. The Love Boat. Okay. Remember watching the Love Boat TV show? That's what I was looking for. The Love Boat. There's a Love Boat right there. We got a Love Boat We're going on there. We got that. Is that? Did you turn it on? Yeah. Okay. What was the show on after that, though, with Ricardo Montalbán and uh, the, plane, the little guy? The plane. The plane. The plane. The plane. The plane. Fantasy Island. Fantasy, Fantasy Island. Island. There you go. Just. Whoa. How did I do that? That's great. I can't even remember what the word of the day is. <laughs> even after he's told. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It is the first Sunday in September, 2023. What do you think about that? Remember, way, way back, remember that science fiction movie? Uh, what was it, 2010? Uh, we're way past that. And uh, who was the guy who sang Purple Rain? What was his name? Prince. Prince. Prince had that song, 1999. Dan, or I mean, uh, Don and Gail probably danced to that. Uh, I'm not a Prince fan. <laughs> You're not a Prince fan. He's from Minnesota. I gotta be. A... All right. <laughs> Who's still alive? Stole August. Stole August. It's somebody stole August. Stole August. I mean, it, I don't remember. That's yeah, true. and thank goodness. Yeah. But praise the Lord, we've got some nice rain. You know, unfortunately, a, a, some people got too much rain. Um, Looks like we got some out front here. Yeah. So today, uh, as usual, we will be taking our devotional study from uh, this wonderful book that was written by a genius. Uh, no, that's not true. This is where it comes from 365 day devotional words of god for the heart it's available on amazon and it's available to any veteran at no cost here if you're watching on channel one at the veterans home uh, if you do not have one of these we would love to give you one and uh, if you're watching on some other platform get a hold of us and we would love to get all the veterans that would like one, a word of God for the heart book so you can hear God's word for your heart. Today's word is harvest. No matter what Paul says, don't listen to Paul today. Good thing I'm not up there. Good thing. We'd be duking it. We'd be doing a different word. So we're here. We have our worship leader back, Hogan Powell, and uh, he is doing a request for us today uh, based on our word harvest. 
So this is my partner in crime today, uh, Don. And uh, Don, you want to open us in prayer, uh, read the verse, whatever, and then Hogan can lead us in a couple worship songs. Thank you. Okay. Lord, uh, we're grateful again to be able to come out here to the second call of the people these guys and gals and where we love them and uh, we know you love them too. And so we, we love the music in our <coughs> on Sunday mornings. Today's word is harvest. Lord, and so we just ask that you would bless this word to their heart today and bless Rick as he brings it. And uh, we thank you for this, uh, this morning, uh, beautiful weather here in St. George. And, uh, for all your, uh, for all the things that you do for us, Lord, we just uh, we just give you thanks and uh, in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Okay, Mr. Hogan, take it away. Well, we got uh, bringing in the sheaves. This this ought to go hand in hand with what Rick's talking about today. At least that's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Another, another good opening. 
Yep. Well, listen, the nuts are only a good eat, and amazing grace kids doesn't have a lot of stuff. Because we just keep it kind of yep. simple. Sunday when you can have two, <laughs> right? That's right. So what do you got for us today? Harvest. The, uh, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. That's Matthew 9, uh, verses 37 through 38. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, Especially with Hogan's uh, choice of songs today, of course, I, I asked him to sing that, bring in the she's because we're going to talk about, we're going to use Psalm 126, verse 6. That's where this song was written from. Uh, but then he chose Amazing Grace, you know, and it talks about who saved a wretch like me. And you know, there's more purpose of God saving wretches like me and you than just saving us. It's bigger than that. And uh, we're going to see that, that yes, God wants to save you. He wants to save me. But he wants to then use us to let the same gospel that we heard that changed our lives. I don't know about you, but Jill and I have any more of these? We're, uh, I think there's some on the other. Yeah, there's some extra right there. In front. Okay, I'm sorry. That's right. Uh, you know, Jill and I were not looking to get saved that um, fall night on our college campus. Um, we weren't looking for God, but God was looking for us, and he saved us. You know, 
somebody who's the word saved literally means saved from death we're not like saved from going to a bad restaurant somebody says oh don't go there you know the food is horrible we're not talking about that kind of saved we're talking about somebody that's on a train track and the train is coming full speed doesn't see them or sees them and is going to intentionally destroy them and somebody comes and saves that person or in a car accident maybe you've had this personal experience you've come up on a, on a accident and maybe even the paramedics aren't there yet or whatever um, or they are and you know those those people are going to die unless someone saves them no if ands or buts about it without any medical attention that person is going to die then the paramedics show up you know uh, Jill's uh, sister one of her sisters was in a horrible motorcycle accident and uh, there just happened to be an ambulance coming by and uh, the motorcycle uh, her boyfriend was driving was going around a curve and it on water it was raining and just slipped and um, her leg was almost severed and if the ambulance wouldn't have just happened to be there um, she would have died no whip ends or but so she was saved literally saved if you and I go into cardiac arrest we can't save ourselves we can't get up, go get the AED, um, you know, set it all up, put it on ourselves, and listen to it. Does it say shock or no shock? You know, we're the ones in trouble, and we need to be saved. Well, every single time in the Bible, when it says that we are saved, you know, like this song, we're amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It's it's in the passive form, meaning the action is being done to us. So if Jesus saves me, and then he said, those who the Father put in my hand, I can never lose. If Jesus saved me, can I ever unsave me? If Jesus saved me, then I'm saved. Now listen to this, how salvation and now the other part is kind of where we live, too. And a lot of religions infuse themselves, denominations, churches, whatever you want to call them, infuse themselves into the gospel by saying, okay, God saved you, but now you have to, saved you from death going to hell, but now you have to work to get to heaven. But that's not what the Bible says. So we say we are saved by grace through faith right here in Ephesians 2. Uh, the whole uh, verse is or a chapter is about it. But we read and we say, for by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God and not of works lest anyone should boast. So a lot of us, you know, are Christianese. We'll say, well, we're saved by grace. Well, to somebody who is raised in a um, Jesus plus works religion, that's they consider that cheap grace. They think, oh, so that's all you have to do is raise your hand and, and pray with the pastor or, as Don might allude to, uh, uh, an encounter with the Billy Graham Association. Uh, oh, you just have to walk up at a Billy Graham convention and and pray and, and you're saved and that's it. Well, uh, anybody who is saved, it's not that salvation process is not complete, completely what God desires. So let me read to you. I just read, you know, that very famous verse, 
For by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But it goes on, the verse that follows, many people don't know. For we are his, meaning God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for, what's those two words there, Don? Good works. For good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, the worst thing, you've heard me say this, the worst thing that somebody can say to you and I, it, when they find out we're Christians, they're like, you're a Christian? I would have never guessed. Well, we want them to say, you're a Christian? Oh, well, that makes a lot of sense. That makes sense now. So we have the salvation process, but then, then what? What could... What does God desire, or what would he, um, yeah, what's his desire? Not requirement, uh, but desire. Well, that's where this word harvest comes in. If you notice in our verses, it's used three times. When there's a word used in one verse three times, you know, when we're parents, we tell our kids one time, did we mean it? Yeah. Go clean your room. Did we mean it? Yeah. What about the second time? Go clean your room. Do we mean it? Yeah. What about if we say the third time? We really mean it, right? And if not, then there's probably going to be consequences, right? So three times. So Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says, the harvest truly is plentiful. So picture that in your mind. A harvest field. You know, Jill and I live in this in the little valley that goes along um, Dixie Downs, and there's still some farmland there. So we can see the alfalfa growing and maturing, and then the cutting, and then the drying uh, of it, and then the baling. Uh, we can see that whole process as we go by through um, the different um, crops. The harvest truly is plentiful. You know, when we moved to Utah, became a pastor in Utah, some people would say, oh, how can you pastor in Utah? You know, there's so many of, you know, different religion and so powerful. And um, Pastor Chuck used to say, Chuck Smith, who's, who God used to start Calvary Chapel, he says, where do you want to go? We were talking about fishing. Where do you want to go fishing? where everybody else is fishing or do you want to go where there's only one or two other people fishing you know i'm going there right because there's more fish for me to catch then i'm not bumping into elbows i went to i went to alaska one time and i i did i learned combat fishing <laughs> that's what they call it combat fishing you are shoulder to shoulder this roaring river is going by, and you've got to get in the groove with the rest of the guys or you get kicked out. you got to cast your line, and then all the lines go down at the same time. And then you reel in at the same time, and it's the symphony of fishing. And then as soon as somebody catches one, everybody else brings in your line. Well, first they say, fish on. Oh, yeah, you got to yell, fish on, fish on. And then everybody reels theirs in because they don't want you to lose your fish because of them. Their line gets tangled. I have no idea why I'm talking about that. But <laughs> <laughs> the harvest, well, salmon, they're plentiful. But the laborers are few. Now, don't pass up that l word laborer. What does a laborer do? Works. Right? Master Sergeant, when you had however many in your crew, did you expect those young enlisted men to just sit around and smoke cigarettes and tell stories about girls? Nope. nope. What did you want them to do? Not ever I told. <laughs> <laughs> Dave said, whatever I told him. Probably worked. It, did it work? 
Every time. Do, do say no to him? Well, after uh, the first time. After the first time. Uh, after. <laughs> oh, so you had to tell him a couple times. Only once. Only once. You only had to tell him twice, once, one right? Guy, one guy twice, that was it. One guy twice, and that was it. Yeah. <laughs> one call, that's all. That's good. <laughs> so, the harvest, truly splendible, but the laborers, the ones who are working for that harvest are what? Few or many? What does it say? Few. It says few. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt, you know, watching TV or going to a party with non-believers or just watching the news and just feel like, good Lord, there are so few Laborers. There's so few who are serving the Lord. Have you ever felt that way? Well, don't be distraught because if he's for us, who can be against us? And there, there is nothing impossible with God. Nothing. But the laborers are few. Therefore, pray. So if the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few... You know, we might not be able to get the crop in before the big storm comes or this or that or whatever. Before the locusts come back in the day, you know, they knew those locusts were coming and they'd go out and try and harvest as much. And it happened in Little House on the Prairie. So it must have been true. Must have been. You know, so COVID now. COVID. So what's the first thing Jesus says to resolve the problem? Pray. Number one is pray. You know, from my far left, Don, to my far right, Claire, you may think you're out of the ministry. You may think that you're out of the harvest. You may think, oh, well, back in the day when I went to church, when, when I helped start a Bible study, when I, you know, did Bible studies on uh, base with some of the guys or whatever you did. Um, maybe you had a home fellowship in your home. Don and Gail, you had one in your home. And Jill and I had one in our home. And, you know, we're getting to the point where we just couldn't host. We couldn't do that anymore. Oh, we're has-beens. No. What's the very first thing that you and I can do that Jesus says? Pray. Number one, do you have any family members who are not saved? What's the first thing you can do? Pray, because when you pray, you bring it into the spiritual realm. And let me ask you God's record in the spiritual realm. Has God ever lost a battle in the spiritual realm? Never. I learned that in the very first pastor's conference I went to. My wife and I went to up in Washington. I was pastor maybe one or two years. And that was a main teaching. And that's a long time ago to remember pray. Do you have family members that are not saved? Do you have neighbors that are not saved? Do you have co-workers that are not saved? Do you have enemies that are not saved? Do you have longtime friends who are not saved? Can you do anything about it? Yes. What did Jesus say? Not Pastor Rick and uh, Calvary Chapel. What did Jesus say? Pray. Pray the Lord of the harvest. You say, Lord, they're yours. You want to save them. Lord, I pray that you would save them. Lord, use me as much or as little as you want to save them. But I can be involved and you can be involved in the harvest by number one, praying. And number two, what does it say? What's that last sentence there, Don? To send, yep. oh, to send laborers into the harvest. Okay. To send laborers. We're going to pray for the Lord of harvest to send laborers out into the harvest. So, God, send more laborers. Do you know anybody who's laboring um, or thinking about laboring? Um, a church that you want to send out laborers into the harvest field. Pray for them. Put them on a list. 
You know, put them on a list. Um, I'm a kind of a organizer, boom, boom. I can't just pray each day. I have to have a list. I have to have, I pray for this on Monday, this Tuesday, this Wednesday. This, because I want to pray the whole gamut. I want to pray, I want to, you know, and so part of it is I pray for all the pastors that I know of Calvary Chapels. I um, break down all of our workers around the world and I pray for two or three of them a day and um, and for more and so on. I've talked a lot. What do you, you said you had some well, things some, to some, share. Sometimes. Oh, did you want to talk about the... You, whatever Billy you Graham, want to talk about. Billy Graham thing. Just, whatever you want to talk about. Well, I had a personal experience with this. This first when I was working for Honeywell, we went to Minneapolis several times. But one time, uh, Billy Graham's office was there. And he had never come to Utah. And so I went down to his office hoping to be able to, I didn't expect to talk to him, but I was hoping to talk to somebody, but his office was closed. This isn't a real uh, God story, is it? <laughs> but anyway, I left him this message. I said, oh, this is quite a whole lot. And I'm going to usually come to Utah. Because he never, he never has. And I, I wondered why. I think I know why, but I, I'm not sure. But that's, anyway. that's pretty gutsy. Huh? I'm well, proud of you. Yeah. Well, Go I, down and tell Billy Graham to, what to do? Yeah. That's what like you're God or something? That was my plan. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So, um, anyway. No, no, no. Billy didn't come. <laughs> what? He didn't tell me why he didn't. What? Yeah, none of that. But you know, that's exciting to me. I mean, that the Holy Spirit in you urged you enough to go down and encourage one of the greatest evangelists of all time to come where, why did you want him to come to Utah? Is the harvest few or is the harvest plentiful in Utah? Well, the harvest is plentiful, but I don't know about the laborers. You know, it's a, it's a lot different now, I think. Yeah. The Lord's done oh. great things in Utah mm -hmm. since I've been saved. And, uh, you know, even, even look at St. George. Mm -hmm. the, there's some Bible-believing, teaching churches, not just Calvary Chapel, but that's one. But there are others that are teaching the Bible right here in yep. downtown St. George. And so the Lord's done plenty. Um, and I think the LDS Church, they, they liked Billy Graham. So I think he would have had a big draw in Utah, maybe too big. I don't know, but... Anyway, I left him this note and, and asked him what he was telling him in my name. Bless his heart. Did you give him your office number upstairs where you were? Well, I was I was out of Salt Lake. Oh, I was, I was just I, back I, on, I, Oh, you're back there. Okay. On a training trip okay. or a management trip or something. Okay. Gotcha. Several times. All right. Yeah. So I wanted him to come to Utah. But anyway. All right. That's my story about this this thing. But you know, I want to say um, when you talk about have you ever felt like the salmon just swimming upstream all, all the time? <laughs> the anyway, I felt like the salmon sometimes. Salmon were, were elusive. Yeah. You and, were never going to get one. And like, well, I, mean, I felt like being a salmon, swimming upstream. Oh, you yeah. felt like being a salmon. He was the salmon. Yeah. You look kind of like a salmon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, side note. No, well, that goes with the chosen. You know, if you watch the movie, uh, The Chosen, yeah. in the beginning, it's right, all the fish, they're one color, they're blue and they're all going in one way. And then it took a couple it, episodes, I think, yeah. for a lot of people to catch. Hey, wait a second. The fish turn. There's, they they turn, turn and they turn a different color way. and they start going the other way. Yeah. And with each episode, it's more and more and more fish are turning. Um, so let's just real quickly just kind of go through this. No, go through this to put these, the spiritual side and the physical side. Because Jesus, he always used parables to make things simpler. He always taught his disciples. He always explained that to them to make it more simple, not more difficult. And so... This is kind of in the middle of his ministry in Matthew chapter 9. 
And it's just before he sends them out on their own first little missions journey. And uh, it's, it's interesting. So we've already seen that the harvest truly is plentiful. We've agreed that the laborers are few. We agree that the first thing that we can do is pray. And maybe that's the only thing we can do is pray. But it's powerful. Just, I mean, read Daniel's prayer and then Michael the archangel coming and saying, I was dispatched to come to you the moment you began to pray. And I've been fighting the prince of evil. And then Gabriel, I think, had to come and take him so I could come or vice versa. Because Gabriel always announced. So Gabriel comes to Daniel. Um, if you notice in the Bible, Gabriel's always the, the angel that proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. That's his job, Gabriel. Uh, Michael, the archangel, he's, he's the com commander of the Lord's army. And so if you see him, last you see him in, in uh, Revelation, he's battling with Satan for the body of Moses. At, or is that in Jude? I think that's in Jude. And uh, he says, he pulls out his secret, you know, saber sword. And he says, the Lord condemn you. You know, he was at his end of his strength, and so he pulls out his God card, his God saver. And so, har plentiful labors are few, pray for the harvest, and send out labors. So let me ask you, why does a farmer plant seed? Why? That's a real question. Why, why does a farmer plant, let's just say, to grow. wheat. To grow. Okay, so you put that seed in the ground, and the first thing you want it to do is grow. You want that seed that looks dead. There's no life in that seed whatsoever. That seed can sit there for year upon year upon year upon year and not do a single thing until you place it in the ground. You water it. And then it's watered. And then the sun. And then this miracle happens called germination. And we have no idea how that miracle works. I mean, we know the mechanics. But who started that? Who, who created a dead seed to, turn, to, to have to go into the ground, get water, get nutrients, get sun, the temperature, the, the soil at this right temperature to cause the seed to disintegrate so that the first thing you want to see is those little teeny sprouts, sprouts right? Is that success? Does the farmer go home and say to the wife, we did it, honey, we, we raised a crop of one inch plants. It's the beginning. It's the beginning. Now what do we want that one inch uh, plant to do? To grow to what level? To produce more seeds. To produce more seeds. So it has to, that one seed has to produce more seeds at maturity. We want that little tiny infant plant to come to the full maturity of why we planted it. And then we're going to stand in, uh, next to the field and say, wow, look at that corn. Eight feet tall. There must be 10 to 12 ears of corn on each stalk. That's amazing. You got to harvest it. You got to harvest it. The whole idea is to turn one into Many. 30, 60, 100 fold, right? That's why the farmer plants that seed. Why did God plant the seed in your and my life, the seed of the gospel? Why? So that, number one, it would germinate in our hearts and we would come what? Alive. And we would begin to grow. And grow more and more until we come into maturity. 
And part of that maturity is impacting other people's lives to create more seed. You know, when we come here on Sundays, this is good seed. This is good stuff. If you get a chance to talk to your family members, you get a chance to talk to your community members, tell them, we talked about the craziest word on Sunday. We talked about harvest. You know how it works? I don't know. You plant the seed, it grows. Oh, let me tell you. Yeah, let me tell you about the physical side of a farmer growing plant, but let me tell you what God wants to do in your and my life. And you can plant a seed. So, the harvest physically is the act of reaping and harvesting a crop. What's the harvest spiritually? When God saves me, does he just want to save me? Not just want to. So that's part of it. He wants to save me, but then what does he want my life? I, what was I created for? I am his workmanship Created for what? Good works. I'm created that he prepared beforehand that I should live in them. God didn't save you and I just to save you and I. When he saved you and I, he saved you and I and that we would therefore be laborers in the harvest field. Some way, shape or form. And I know practically every person in here personally, and I know how God has used you, I believe will continue to use you as laborers in the harvest. So a farmer plants, I'm just reading the page now, a farmer plants seeds so they may harvest crops. The word of God is likened to a seed that when it is planted in our heart, it brings forth first what? Eternal Eternal life. life. That, that dead seed turning into that green little um, sprout, right? That's its first intention. Then that seed is intended to produce a harvest. Jesus told his disciples two ways to be part of bringing in the sheaves. Here he told them to pray, and then he empowered them to go and tell of his truth. If you look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 and 38, it's, it's the very last two verses of chapter 9. But listen how chapter 10 starts. And when he had called his 12 disciples, those that he just said, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the, into the harvest. He calls his 12 disciples to him and he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. And these 12, Jesus sent out and commanded. So guess what? First thing he says is, pray for me to send out laborers. And then what did he say? He's like, there you are. Now go. I just prayed for you to go. And you know what? It's He empowered them. Don't think that you got to share this good news by yourself and your own. Well, how much of the message do I remember? You remember enough of the message that God will bring to remembrance. That's the Holy Spirit's job. He'll bring to remembrance the things that Jesus said. Not necessarily Rick or Don, but what Jesus said. And then he sends those very ones that said, he said, I want first, number one, to pray to, for me to send out labors. And guess what? Now I'm sending you out as labors. I love that. I think that he set them up. I think, you know, Jesus was great at that. He never wasted. You learned some stuff from him. You learned some stuff. You did. You learned how to I, do I, that little bit. I learned a little bit of that. From, <laughs> if, I was, if I was any good at anything, hopefully I was good at encouraging people to personalize the gospel and to go.
Um, so here's the here's bringing in the sheaves. I want to read it, and then we'll, let's do communion. Um, in fact, while I'm passing out communion, if you want to, or I mean, while you're passing out communion, I'll read this. And Hogan, if you want to back me up with some, um, maybe just play the instrumental of bringing in the sheaves. I'm going to go to Psalm 126. Oh, you can read it. Go ahead. You want me to read it? You read it. Okay. Psalm 126, verses 1 through 6. It's a song of ascent. When the Lord brought back the captive of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Then our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue was singing. Then they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. <clears throat> Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the strings of the sound. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for souls, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing the sheaves with him. So you know what? Just go out and share what you know. And one day when you walk into heaven, um, you're going to bring in the sheaves. I don't know how God's going to say, see all those people right there? They're here because I used you. So we want to pass out communion, please. Well, we're going to take communion just as Paul um, retaught the church in Corinth. He had taught them this one time when he was there, and he had left, and the church had become a mess. And so he wrote First and Second Corinthians to reteach the church. And in First Corinthians 11, verse 23, he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me paul then went on to say for as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death till Yeah. 
breaking stuff. Well, we've had a great time in the Lord today. Haven't we, Don? We have. Every, every Sunday morning. There we go. Every Sunday morning, 9 o'clock. Yeah. Any thoughts, comments? I thought it was interesting when Jesus sent them out. He sent them out with, to take them out with one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Jesus doesn't force himself on anyone. He doesn't make anyone. You know, a lot of people, especially in the Middle East, European, they'll say, well, Christianity is the same as, you know, Islam. Uh, or, you know, younger people who don't want to believe, they'll say, well, they're all the same, you know, in the 300s. You know, the Crusaders went through and pointed a knife, a sword to everybody and said, believe in God or die. And then Muhammad did the same thing in 700s. He pointed a sword at everybody from Europe all the way down to North Africa and said, you know, believe in Allah or die. Um, but Jesus never threatens anyone. The honors. Want to close us in prayer, Don? Yeah. Lord, we're, uh, we're grateful for this word today. The harvest is a, a word of joy to our heart. Uh, your scripture even says that every time a sinner can repent, sometimes we can just rejoice in heaven. So, Lord, we thank you for this, for this word, for the day. We uh, just ask you to bless each of us here and those watching online. Amen. Amen. The author of uh, Amazing Grace.